Right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome um, to this webinar. Uh, my name is Peter Sandberg, and I'm the CEO of the Swedish Chamber of Commerce in the UK. And I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this webinar on how we can hopefully uh, emerge stronger on the other side of the pandemic. Uh, and for everyone's benefit, today's webinar is really about looking forward and um, ahead of what's to come. So um, we talk about it a lot and, um, and have done so for the, the last couple of weeks, what will constitute the new normal, how will consumers, markets and behavior change, and uh, what will it mean for business and investments, and what can we do to make sure that we, whether we're businesses or society or, or countries, um, come out on top. For those of you who do not know us, uh, we're the Swedish Chamber of Commerce, uh, a Swedish-British business platform. We were founded in 1906 before uh, both world wars, so I think we're, we're solid enough. Um, we today represent some 400 plus corporate members and we help businesses establish, grow and develop. And it's a super network, by the way, for those of you who are not members just yet. Just wanna put that in there. Um, today's event is a joyous partnership from our end together with our generous sponsors, uh, Hondas Bank in UK and Volvo Trucks. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's also a partnership with the UK Department for International Trade, the British Chamber of Commerce in Stockholm, uh, our Swedish Chamber friends in France, uh, the Netherlands and Switzerland, and also Thinking the Unthinkable. Um, but as I said, today is about the, um, the future and I think we've got a stellar lineup of speakers. Uh, from very different uh, sectors and walks of life. Uh, I look forward to hearing their uh, take uh, on how we can all emerge stronger on the other side. Just a, a very brief note on housekeeping. Um, uh, as we're on a webinar, it's very simple. We just kindly ask you to be in a quiet space. If you have questions for the panel, and we really hope that you do, because today has been designed to be as interactive and engaging as possible. Uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, um, if you're on a computer at least. Uh, and if you have any technical issues, please use the chat function and speak to one of my lovely colleagues. Um, both Matilda and Anna from the SEC team are super well equipped to help you with technical issues. Uh, I should also mention that this webinar will be recorded, so bear this in mind if you ask uh, questions that you may not want to be uh, too formal with. Uh, I now want to hand over to uh, the MC of the day, Nick Gowing, founder of Thinking the Unthinkable, former BBC uh, World uh, News presenter. Um, Nick has a long career uh, in UK media, and lots of you would have come across him, uh, I'm sure. He's an advisor on leadership challenges too, to the uh, UN General Assembly. Uh, and Nick, that's sort of one of those amongst many other things. Um, your CV is a bit too long uh, to go through, but we're super happy to work with you again. Uh, and it is with warm and comfortable hands that I hand over to you. Thanks very much, Peter, and hello, everybody. Um, yes, indeed. I should tell you, thinking the unthinkable is what we need to do today. What is the unthinkable? What is the unpalatable? What is the possible? And that's very much the framing uh, between now uh, and uh, 85 minutes uh, from this point. Uh, we do have a significant number of contributors, but what, the one thing I'd like to emphasize at the moment is we want to hear from you. We want to have you setting the agenda as much as me asking questions. The less you hear from me, the better. And what I'd like to do is encourage you to use that Q&A function immediately if you have particular questions, certainly for Lord Grimston, uh, who's joining us as well. He'll be opening in a moment the Minister for Investment here in the UK. He'll be talking to us from uh, just uh, central London. Also, Roger Alm, uh, the president of Volvo Trucks, who's uh, speaking to us from central Sweden. So if you've got particular points for them, please let's hear from you as soon as possible. Then we can manage it because otherwise the number of questions coming in could be overwhelming. Can I give you a personal thought on this? Um, emerging stronger on the other side, what awaits us at the end of the pandemic? I'd like to help you frame your thinking by saying, is there going to be an end to the pandemic? Because a couple of mornings ago, I was with David Navarro, who's the senior envoy to the World Health Organization. I quote to you what he said, this is not a trivial illness. We must live with the threat for the foreseeable future. It is possible to get ahead of the virus, but it is hard. I put that in as the uh, medical rider to everything you're considering because it's too easy to talk about 
after COVID-19 and uh, uh, the new normal. So bear that in mind in the framing of everything that you're going to say and ask, I hope as well. So I want to make it as vibrant, as interactive as possible, as uh, certainly as much as this allows us to do. What I'd like to do before we go to Lord Grimston and Roger is just introduce uh, the other uh, speakers as well. And I've given them notice of this. Um, first of all, uh, let's go to uh, Helen Barnacle, who's Chief Executive of Microsoft in Sweden, who's speaking to us from Stockholm. 15 seconds, uh, Helen. Uh, do you think that we will get out of this? Will we emerge stronger on the other side? Good morning and thank you, Nick, for that. Yeah, yes, I'm a passionate believer. I love the theme of today. I, I do believe that we will, we have an opportunity to emerge stronger uh, uh, as we are getting out of this. And I think it's up to us, all of us actually, in taking leadership roles in, in making sure we do. Thank you, Helen. Let's go to Tom Johnston, Chairman of the Board for Hasprana, who's joining us from Gothenburg, Göteborg. Uh, Tom, uh, your view, are we going to emerge stronger from all of this? Yes, I believe so. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, everybody. I believe so. As we embrace the new way of working, if we embrace the new technology, or as we embrace them, as we embrace the opportunities in our supply chain, I believe we will emerge stronger from this. Yes. Thanks, Tom. More from you uh, later. Let's go to Tove Liefendahl, uh, who's political editor-in-chief at Svenska Dagbladet. Uh, it's talking to us from Uppsala. Particularly uh, your view, Tove, in 15 seconds of the impact for politics and also society. Well, I think as a community, we will emerge stronger on the other side of what we perceive as a crisis. But as individuals, families and workplaces, we will have experienced very different realities. So that will create different demands on politics. And I think we can come back to that later, but we will surely come out not, we will have not one common experience from this, but very many different. Thank you, Tove. Finally, to Mikael Sorensen, Chief Executive of Handelsbank and uh, UK, who joins us from Gothenburg. Uh, Mikael, the same question to you. Thank you, Nick. Well, actually, I'm sitting in my, my office here in London. So, um, ah. But uh, uh, um, eventually, yes, I do believe that we will emerge stronger. But uh, I also do believe that there will be some bumps on the road uh, getting there. All right. Well, thank you, all four of you. Let's now go to Lord Grimston, uh, Minister for Investment. Uh, uh, Jerry, if I may call you Jerry, um, you haven't been in that job very long. What are you seeing? What are the prospects? We look forward to your 10 minutes of remarks. Lord Grimston. Are you well, good unmuted? Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Peter Sandberg for um, the introduction and especially to my old friend, old friend Nick Gowing. Um, I always know that when Nick is comparing an event like this, um, he'll keep uh, he'll keep uh, he'll keep us going. He'll be he'll be both fierce and kind, <laughs> and I'm expecting an interesting morning. Um, look, before I start, um, if people don't mind, I just want to say that important though events like today's are, even more important is keeping ourselves, our loved ones, our friends, and families safe. And I have the, the deepest sympathy for people who have lost their loved ones during this terrible, terrible pandemic. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be here today, um, not just because I know Sweden well, and I have a deep respect for its history, norms and culture. My, my children are part Swedish, but also because Sweden has been a crucial trading partner for the UK for more than five centuries with the trading goods and services last year being worth more than 23 billion pounds. From cars to chemicals, from energy to electrical goods, fish to finance, if it's made in Sweden, there's likely to be a lucrative market for it here in the UK. And of course, your nation is also a major investor in the UK economy, as we are in yours, um, with hundreds of companies, hundreds of Swedish companies doing, doing business here. Have I just lost you? You're still with us, I think, um, Lord Grimston. Oh, I'm still with you, my good, sorry, yeah, I just lost the video. Okay, let me, let, me, let me just carry on. Um, tens of thousands of Swedes, of course, now live and work in Britain, and we value the huge contribution that they make to the economic and cultural life of our nation. Likewise, more than thousands of Brits have made Sweden their home. But look, coming back to the pandemic, it doesn't need me to tell you the scale and extent of the crisis that has engulfed in the world. Um, I just turned 70, I was born immediately in the post-war period. 
but I, I, I feel that the challenges that we are we are we are facing aren't different to those that my that my parents' generation faced 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 during the war. Now, look, governments have rightly and properly reacted in different ways according to their different circumstances. And it's far too early to pass judgment on that. But all governments have had two objectives, saving lives and keeping their economies ticking over so as to be in a state as to rebound once the peak of the crisis passes. And the UK, as has Sweden, introduced a, a suite of economic measures which I won't attempt to catalogue in these opening remarks, other than to say that they have been targeted at our smallest companies right up to our largest companies. Strange thing for an ex-Treasury official to say, but money has been no object. Saving lives was our utmost priority. And of course, when you do introduce economic measures as, as, as quickly as that, there were some rough edges when they were first introduced, but I would say now that they have broadly settled down and, and have been widely welcomed. Now, as to, as to a bit about my role and myself, I took up my ministerial role about nine weeks ago, and I have served all but two days in lockdown since then, working from my, working from my home, um, apart from one occasion in, in Parliament. Um, I feel my background has ideally suited me for this role. Um, I was a, a, a civil servant, a government official many years ago. I worked for Margaret Thatcher during the privatisation period. I did 26 of the UK privatisations. I've been a banker, a company chairman, and I've served on company boards throughout the world. And I think going forward, I'm pleased to have this background for reasons I'll come to in a moment. I think that my job I now have is one of the most important jobs in the government. Why is this? Unprecedentedly, the globe is faced, the world is faced with a global recapitalization after this crisis. We've had company recapitalizations, We've had sector recapitalizations, we've had regional recapitalizations, but never before have we had a global recapitalization. Coupled with that, I believe that five years of societal and commercial change will be telescoped into the next five months. Different ways of working. I don't speak to a CEO around the world who does not believe that they will be working in a completely different fashion. I was speaking to the chairman of a major British bank two weeks ago, who have all his call staff, all his call centre staff now working from home. He said to me that their productivity has increased by 40%, 40% since working at home. And he was seriously challenging whether they will ever go back to the old call center ways. Everybody is looking at their office space and wondering whether they need it. I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm a professed globalist. For the last 30 years, it's a surprising week if I've not spent at least two nights on an airplane. I've not now been on a plane since February. Will I ever restart that way of, that way of traveling and living? Supply chains. People did not understand their supply chains. Companies would know who their tier one suppliers were. They had no idea what was below them at tier two and tier three, tier four. It was a bowl of spaghetti. And because of this, they were caught out badly when they realized that their supply chains were not as resilient as they thought that they were. So what's causing that to happen? Everybody is looking at their supply chains. Everybody is thinking that they ought to be shortened and everybody is looking at diversification of risk. But I stress this is not aimed at one country and I would hate for this to shave into a nationalistic debate. It is looking for diversification wherever you need to do that 
to avoid an over-concentration of, of the risk. So how am I going about boosting investment in the UK? Because I believe that two of the best ways that countries are going to come out of this crisis is through global trade and global investment. And the investment landscape is going to look very, very different after this, after this crisis. Investable capital will be in shorter supply. Those who have investable capital won't necessarily be the same people as who had it before the crisis. And every single country in the world, its public finances are going to be under pressure. Because why did I refer to a global recapitalization? Because this is the first time ever, ever, that every single country in the world has been hit by a health shock and an economic shock simultaneously. Now, my intention on investment is quite clear. My responsibilities are quite clear. I'm going to make the UK, I have to, I have to make the UK one of the most investable countries in the world. And how am I going about this? First of all, a top-down macro analysis as to what the world will look like after COVID. We all have to do that. What will be the sources of investable capital? Where will, where will people want to invest for risk, return and diversification? At the opposite end of the vertex, what are our investable sectors? What, what sectors will people want to invest in? What government help should we give to those sectors to make it what is a good investable sector, a excellent investable sector? And of course, our sectors in the UK, such as life sciences, technology, automation, artificial intelligence, autonomous cars, all, all quickly spring to mind. But then most importantly, we have to bring the investor lens into our thinking. Somebody may want to sell something. Somebody else has to want to, has to want to, has to want to buy it. And in the past, we have not thought enough about the needs of investors, because if you understand what investors want to invest in, you can also understand why are they not investing in something. What are the obstacles that have created into our systems that have stopped people wanting to invest in our infrastructure, to have stopped people wanting to put their money into the UK? That, of course, is now coupled with our, our new global trade policies. I'm sure we'll talk later about the, about the, about the EU, but it's no accident that we are proceeding rapidly with free trade agreements with the with the United States, soon to start one with Japan, Australia and New Zealand, and we hope to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership in the not too distant future. Because as I said, it is global trade that is going to hope help pull us out of this. So look, in conclusion, there's a few introductory remarks. The important thing is that like-minded nations such as ours stick together. There are many, many forces in the world which are trying to drive nations apart at the moment. And countries such as Sweden and the UK, we must resist those forces. We must talk about the need for rules-based systems. We must talk about fairness throughout the world and we must act together. Together, we won't just beat the crisis, I really hope it will lead to a better world for future generations. Thank you very much, Nick. Jerry, thank you. Um, just before we go to Roger, um, let me uh, ask you the following, as you've, you've had the privilege of now being invited back into government by the House of Lords, uh, and you did work in government, just very quickly, what is your impression about the agility and nimbleness of public servants to handle the enormity, not just of the medical crisis, but these kind of parameters that you're talking about? In other words, thinking in different ways, quickly if you can. I think it is difficult. I think they, have, I think they are getting there, but this came up very quickly. I mean, I, th I liken it to the early 1940s, where people knew that something terrible was happening, but weren't quite sure how to respond to it. 
new ways have had to be found to be doing things. Experts have been brought in from outside, which I very, very much encourage. Um, and the, con the country has been surprisingly tolerant of the government doing more and more. That will continue because in the crisis going forward, government and people and companies and business sectors will have to work closer and closer together. Because obviously if it's five years into five months, that's a hell of a lot of learning and rethinking outside the natural comfort zones. It is, and mistakes will be made. Let's be frank, Nick. Every country will make mistakes. The, survive, the people who will prosper, and I'm, this is a very important rule, will those who, who adapt quickly, most quickly to this. I always reminded my historic history teacher that when the meteor hit the earth five billion years ago to make the dinosaurs extinct, what survived that crash? The organisms that could adapt most quickly to the future environment. Thanks for the moment. You're going to stay with us, I think, to, for the next hour as well. And I've already got some questions coming in which are appropriate to certainly the UK government. But if we can just hold on that for the moment. Let's now move on to, to Roger, uh, who's joining us uh, from central Sweden. Roger, the floor is yours with some opening remarks. Thank you and good morning, everyone. And it's a great pleasure and privilege for me to take part in, in this uh, seminar and also then for Volvo Trucks. And so if you can take the next slide. Volvo Trucks is a truly global brand and we have been operating for almost 100 years. And I have actually my office only 100 meters from where the first Volvo Trucks rolled out in 1928. We are a Swedish company, as you all know, and this has really formed our visibility and our heritage. And that is also being seen into our core values as quality, safety, and environmental care. Can you take the next slide? The globality of Volvo trucks is that we are operating in 130 countries around the world where we are selling and marketing our products. We are distributing our products throughout the distribution network of 2,100 dealers around the world. And we have a running population of trucks, zero to 10 years old, of one million trucks, where half a million is connected trucks. And we are then been utilizing this connectivity throughout and this pandemic situation. And we can measure them, the utilization of the trucks in the various we can see then the movements of the business. We are assembling trucks in 14 countries around the world. So we have a big setup and a big diverse location and big network in, in the global society. And last year we had the record deliveries where we delivered 131,000 trucks globally. However, I think it will take some time until we will come back to these numbers Yeah. Can you take the next slide? Also then for the UK and Ireland organization where we are sitting, where the people are sitting as you are today and where the seminar is, 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 is broadcasted from. We have a strong business in the UK and Ireland countries and we have a market share close to 20%. And it's actually then this operation in UK is actually the fifth largest country in the world for Volvo trucks. We are servicing and selling our products in 81 locations throughout these two countries. And we're also then having around 50,000 trucks operating and running on the roads in UK and transporting goods and supporting the society and also the economy. Can you take the next slide? When we talk about the pandemic, pandemic or the corona crisis, and it started actually in a very, very different way for Volvo trucks. And if I go back to the beginning of 2020, we in January, we informed and disclosed the best year ever for the Volvo group and Volvo trucks in our quarterly report that we pre presented to everybody in the beginning of January. And then we also then had planned for the biggest launch ever of a new truck range of four new models. And that was a huge event that we 
have been working with and we have been working with the product development for close to seven years. And we were now to bringing these product range to the markets. And we had invited 7,500 customers to Gothenburg to go through this event. And you can see here on the picture that there's a tower of the new products that we are intending to launch or should launch at this period of time. And I am actually standing on the top there. You can see a person there and that's actually me. And that is for real. We did it for real put four trucks on top of each other and me on the top of it. So there is a good strange of these product range that can carry this weight of each other, including myself. However, when we had done the press release, or we should do the press release, then the situation came with the coronavirus and we had to postpone the press release. We had to postpone the introduction of the event that we should have here in Gothenburg. We had to cancel everything. And of course, that has a huge impact on all the suppliers that we had invited, all the customers that we had invited, and also geared up the whole organization to be part of this launch and the NED that we have been driving up for quite a number of times. But this was the situation, and we then started with then postponing then the launch and delaying that one, but finally we had to cancel it all. And we also then had to cancel then the production start of this new product range. And we had to delay that six months. So this is where we came from. And this is where everybody was, was waiting for the launch. And now we had complete new situation with the biggest price ever since the Great Depression. So we need to adapt ourselves extremely fast to the new situation. So can you take the next slide? To do that, we really put it up three priorities when they really start. What is the most important for us? And how will we drive our business now going further on? And it starts with people and health and safety. And people is number one priority for us. And we need to protect our people in our organization. And we need to make sure that our people is then can work in a very good environment and a healthy and safe environment. And we will not make any compromise to that at all. So of course, a lot of people now is working from home and we have a lot of people as well that is on furlough, so it's not working at all. So that is the situation from a people point of view. Then we move into the customers. And what we also have done here, really then to tighten up the bands with our customers and to stay very close to our customers and protecting them the front line of our organization and that we can deal with the customers and support the customers into their yard. And if we have a difficult time, the customers will also then have a very difficult time throughout this situation also. So we are supporting them very heavily and keeping the trucks on the road so they can perform their business but we have also done many customers that have ended into payment problems and we need to help them to support them with rescheduling on payment plans, etc. And then the business, of course. How do we manage then the business? And of course, that is of extremely difficult and different to manage a business today than it was some three, four months ago. So we need to do a lot of cost avoidance. We need to then handling our operation in a different way, reduce activities, take out cost in the organization heavily. And then it's about cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. So we need to then make sure and keep control of our cost and capital in terms of capital tied up. And we need to then work heavily then to reduce inventory get receivables down so we get collection from a customer point of view so they are paying the bills that they should do. So this is what we need to then focus on and where we are focusing on people, customers and business. And to do all of this, it is a different way to lead an organization. So of course that means leadership is more important than ever. And we can talk about talent review. And today it's actually talent review in leadership every, every day. Can you take the next slide? Next slide, please. Thank you. So in this crisis, our customers, the transport company, plays a very, very important role in the society. 
They are transporting and delivering food, medical equipment, and medicals to people that need this in the situation that we are. So we need to keep the wheels moving. And if our customers is not making the transport, we will not get the supply of the goods that we need. To support our customers, we also then set very high ambition how we will have our workshops in operations. And we have been handling then an openness of our workshops throughout this very difficult time on a high level and also then being able to support them in the good parts of availability throughout this time as well. And I really thank my people for doing this effort. And we had no cases of sickness or virus into our workshop during this period of time. So we managed this in a very planned and organized way and a very structured way. And today we have 99% of all our workshops around the world open out of the 2,100 workshops that we have. And we are servicing and supporting our customers in a very good way. And that is also important that we do that. So we are reinforcing and building relations with our customers. But this makes me very proud because this is people that has walked an extra mile throughout the situation. And we have seen many examples of that throughout this crisis time that we have had. Can we take the next slide? To handle them, the whole situation and get into a very different way of working, what do you do? You need to get grip of the situation because everything is very different from day one. So we need to then work in a different way. But to do that, you need to get grip of the situation. Customers, organization, people, cost, capital are tied up. So you are doing that and set the priorities that you need to do. And then, of course, you need to get the whole organization with you. So we have been running weekly communication every week for our top 200 leaders. So telling them where are we standing, where are we going to get an alignment and understanding how we will drive our company further on. We have seen heavy cancellations from our customers because business is, of course, being reduced. So customers have canceled trucks that we have in production. So we need to handle that and support that and doing this in a good way as possible. But now we can see that orders are slowly ticking back again and but from a low level. And we can also see now that our production is then opening up slightly, but with heavily reduced capacity than we were with in the beginning of 2020. We have approximately 500,000 connected trucks around the world. And thanks to them, we have been able to measure them, the business of our customers throughout this crisis period. And we can see the utilization and how much they are operating. And then we can measure them how the business is going. And we see also now that the utilization of the customer's product is picking up slowly. But of course, we need to prepare our organization for the new normal. And the new normal will be different to the one that we had before. And we estimate that we will have a situation with lower business quite for quite a number of years ahead. And the demands from customers will be lower. And we need to adjust ourselves to that new business model and to the new revenues that we see. And to do that, of course, it means that we need to make very, very tough priorities to keep our position as a leading cross brand, even today and also then into the future. Can you take the next slide? Roger, could I ask you to begin to wind up, please? Okay, I will do that. We are definitely determined to play a leading role in the market that we are. But during the lockdown period, people have experienced them and learned to work in a different way. And I see also then that the environmental situation will have big benefits. And I hope that this will then drive big benefit from an environmental point of view. And we are there with products, with electrification and different kind of fuel activities that we've already started last year. And we are investing heavily in R&D into electrification and all the fuel alternatives that we will bring out to the markets. Connectivity will also then drive a very, very more important role into the future that we can use this in our business and make then our journey going further on. 
So here we have two very big areas that we are investing in and we will not make compromises into these investments that we are doing. And of course, then people will learn to work in a different way. Can you take the next one? So we have also then seen a lot of new things that our organization have done to make business and very, very much innovative things and loan initiatives and then handling and operation that we are doing. We are normally a relation building organization that we are making that business with our customers. We meet our customers on a frequent basis. But now we have learned to do this in a different way. And I'm very proud of the organization, how they manage them to sell trucks from home and to different social medias as well. And I'm convinced that we will continue to do it in this way. And we see that we have a high utilization and a high efficiency into the organization and even then we're working with less people than we had before. So can you take the next one? Roger, could I ask you to wind up? Yeah, it's, it's the last one. Transport will play in a very important role in the society and the current crisis will be even more important that we're keeping the role wheels moving and that the economy is moving and that will be done by truck in the future as well. And we will be part of this to move the world if we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Sorry to interrupt you, but we've got a lot of questions coming in and sure, we have sure. panelists. And I'm going to be driven very much by the questions which we're receiving already. And stay on the line, Roger, because this underpins a lot of the questions which I think all the other panelists need to answer. And it picks up what I was putting to Jerry Grimston as well, the minister. Um, and it's driven by Johanna Kreiser of Kreiser and Company and also Beatrice Bondi from Investor AB. The same kind of question, picking up on what you just said and particularly what Jerry Grimston was saying about the need for adaptability. Very quickly, as you've been speaking, Roger, you, the, what have you discovered about the agility and nimbleness and the willingness and, and those, around, those around you to change the way they're working, change the way they're thinking at very high speed? Because Joanna asks, do you see a need for a new type of organization with a team looking at disruptions in the future? And could you please, from Beatrice here, could you please be more specific about the need for leadership? Quickly, if you can, Roger. No, no, of, of course, this is what we have been working on. And to get what is most important to make than a change that we have been doing during this very short time, that is, of course, leadership. And it's driven by leadership and it's driven a lot about communication that people understand what we are doing, that they buy into what we are doing and that we are then what we see that we need to grab for the future. So, so yeah, and we don't need to make it over complicated as well. It's about talking to the people, get people to understand. But definitely we see new ways of working. I see new ways of them driving an efficiency into an organization point of view. And you're and seeing remember, adaptability, you're seeing adaptability, are you? At high speed? Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. All right, Roger, thanks for the moment. Uh, let me go to Helen um, and then to Tom as well. Helen, your, that question to you as well from Johanna and Beatrice, because it's fundamental to what we're all facing, whether it be in a few months or a few years, about the new need for a new type of organization with a team looking at disruptions in the future and being more specific about how leadership handles this. Uh, mm -hmm. Helen Barnico from uh, Microsoft in Sweden. So just a quick one to, to connect it to what you said. I think the, the fact that the crisis hit, uh, and there's this, it's a bit of an old saying, never to waste a perfectly good crisis, but the speed of which organizations change to me has been dramatic. My own organization, but working with the educational teams, healthcare teams, et cetera, because there was such a dramatic need for it. So I think one is not to lose that, to lose that feeling that we can do these things much quicker than what we tend to do. Um, one of the couple of things we've done uh, is to actually try to move, I'm in a huge organization, but is to, to move empowerment even further closer to the customers than we usually do. And I think this ties into what Roger said, the needs from the customers, they ended up in so many different situations. So, and, and of course, Volvo is one of our customers. So if we couldn't respond to them quickly, it was useless. It would be useless if I responded to, to my big customers a month later, it wouldn't help. So we moved, we try to move and use it to move empowerment closer to the customers. And I think that will uh, remain. I think the third uh, issue that I've seen is that you need to in your own, you need to look at your own leadership uh, and think about how you are agile because what the team needs, <clears throat> what the team needs the first week of this is not the same thing as what the team needs the fourth week of this. 
And this was my learning that in, a, in, in my usual way of working, I can set up my rhythm and my, uh, my rhythm of business and my rhythm of connects and all of it. And now I suddenly had to look at it and tune in every single day and pick up where are my teams and where are they connected to the customers. And I, need to, I needed to adopt really quickly. And I think this we need to build into the um, organizations going forward. Quickly, what's the takeaway then, picking up on Beatrice's question, about the need for a different kind of leadership? Have you been impressed by the agility and nimbleness of thinking? I'm, I'm extremely impressed. I, I'll, give a, I'll, I'll just say one example of, um, just to get, put some numbers to it. <clears throat> education closed down in, um, in high schools in Sweden and, and upper education. And we weren't set up for this. Um, and in one week, if you just take the city of Stockholm, in one week, they turned into... Uh, this um, education online for 28,000 students, 4,500 teachers. They did this in one week. And one of the teachers told me, we've talked about this for two years. Hmm. Now we did this in one week. And this we shouldn't lose. We shouldn't lose that we are able to do this if we set our minds to it. We should not go back to, uh, we should not go back to a more lengthy type of where things tend to be drowning in lots of complexity. That's what I would like to bring forward. Tom, the same to you about nimbleness, agility, what you're seeing um, in, in Husqvarna. I think in Husqvarna and in many other companies I'm involved in, we're seeing the same as Elaine men mentioned. I, I'm really impressed by how quickly the organization has adapted to this new way of working, how they've been able to increase productivity, increase efficiency, and find new ways of working. But what does it mean for leadership? I think it means we need to be much clearer on the objective and the purpose of the company. We must be clear, much cl the, the message has to be much simpler, but we must be flexible. And what we're going to need to do going forward as well, what we're working on is how do we combine together the old way of working with the new way of working to get the best of both worlds, to be able to come up with some hybrid way of working going forward. And I think that's extremely important. When it comes to disruption, I think we've seen disruption very quickly. I'm also involved in education with a school and chairing a company that's doing online education. And the speed of change and how to adapt to these new models has been a very, very impressive. But also, we, we in business, and especially in industrial business, have worked for a while to be able to do not only B2B, but B2B2C or B2C. And that has come now. That's opened up much, much faster. The, the tools to be able to work with our customers, to communicate with them, and to help uh, embrace that has been much, much faster now. So I think things that would have taken years to do has been able to be accelerated in weeks and months, and I think that will continue. But the key is for leadership, clarity of message, clarity of purpose, simplicity. Do you see leadership struggling? My second question, which I could also have put to Roger, of course, is picking up on Jerry Grimston's view as a minister about the need for adaptability, but particularly on the supply chain. How are you reconfiguring that at high speed? I think that's a good point. And I think Lord Grimston highlighted it. I think we were caught out with the supply chain. It was already coming under stress because of the trade disputes, because of natural disasters. But this has really exposed it. And I think going forward, we're going to see a much more regionalized supply chain. Uh, we're going to see a different type of a much more resilient uh, supply chain. And that has been worked on. But to be clear, that's not a quick fix. That will take time. We need to invest in technology. We need 5G, for example. We need that technology to help us make our plants very efficient and effective. We need to invest in upskilling of our people and retraining of our people. And one of our responsibilities as leaders right now is to use this time to reskill and upskill our people. Use the training tools available to do that. And there are several questions on that, but let me just ask you, uh, picking up what uh, Jerry Grimston said, he described the supply chain issue as like a bowl of spaghetti. Is that what you have discovered? In other words, you've been almost shocked and what you've discovered about where the supplies are coming from and what you've got to do about it? I wouldn't say uh, quite as severe as the bowl of spaghetti uh, there, but it's clear that what we've seen is the supply chain uh, uh, resilience has not been what we, what we need to have to go forward, to be flexible going forward. And is that the same for you, Roger, quickly? Yeah, we, we have been working heavily with the suppliers as well. And what we have now, what you, what you need to have in, in today's scenario is not to have single suppliers. You need to have a more flexibility of the supply system. And here we, we have a number of suppliers that we need to help throughout this journey. But we need to then build a more, more flexible.
flexible supply system for the future as well. Thank you. All right, now, Tove, uh, the, the, it's the same kind of question for you, and we were talking about this a couple of days ago, but the societal impact of leadership and nimbleness and agility, what you're seeing, particularly in the political class, um, both in Sweden and elsewhere, given that you are political editor in chief. Well, I mean, before the crisis emerged, we had uh, we were discussing the crisis in political leadership all over in the Western world, uh, and that has now been strained even more. Uh, I want to be an optimistic, so I, I believe that what we are experiencing now it will create another demand uh, from the citizens when it comes to politicians, because it's not only the ability to being elected that's imp important, but also the, the ability to deliver and be something to trust in, especially in, in time of crisis. So I, I hope that we will see a rising demand for politicians who have the possibility also to look around the corner, not, be, or not only being caught in the 24 seven media <laughs> circus that, that I'm a part of, but also have the possibility to look around the corner one very concrete thing is that we will see a rising demand for another level of national and regional emergency preparedness than we had in Sweden and stockpiles, so concrete things. Um, one thing that worries me is that as a result of the fear now, uh, the worries and the sufferings, there will be a raise of demand from some, some, some people, for politicians who sell the promise of no change, keeping society in order, which will be the opposite of what we need. So there, there, there surely will be a, an imp, the political leadership now, it could, could go either way. And uh, I'm, I'm very anxious that we, we will not go for the politicians who will promise that nothing ever will happen in society. But do you, do you think, do you sense that actually, particularly the next generation and their expectations, driven as much by the climate emergency and sustainability, in addition to COVID-19, are actually saying, are the leaders now who are running us really the right people to take us forward? Yeah, but I think we had that, that kind of uh, questioning just before the crisis as well. And, and uh, one answer to that has been the rise of more populistic parties and po populistic uh, political leaders, which uh, hasn't been a good response. So I'm hoping very much now for the politician as a, as a class, if you can call them that, will, you know, rise with the occasion and uh, uh, prove that there is, the, there is still, uh, that, that there is still a leadership which you can trust but I also hope that that one a broader insight uh, which you can gain during crisis like this is society is something far more greater than the public state and that will better understand that it's unintelligent and uh, not it, it's far too risky to hand over too much power to the politicians because if you think that you're going to solve all problems that can emerge or for instance, the problems that a pandemic will, will come with, just being limited to what you could achieve with tax money and regulations, you'll be a very vulnerable society. So the recipe, I think, to build a stronger, more sustainable and durable society is that you need to ensure that all spheres of society can stand stronger in themselves, businesses, the civic society, uh, science, culture, etc. And that insight, I think, if you could, if you could uh, steer the politicians with that insight, we will have a better political leadership. Right. Uh, thank you for the moment, Ove. Uh, let's go to Mika. We haven't forgotten you at all, Mika. There are quite a few questions on, on business, but I'd like you to pick up, particularly because banking has been going through a significant revolution anyway, about yeah. the nature of where money's coming from and who, how the next generation particularly, does, does anyone need cash? But specifically what you see about leadership and skills and adaptability, which was already a major threat to um, to the banking sector, there was a great front cover of the Economist with the butt of the pig being eaten away grad at high speed. How do you think that this is going to affect the, the whole financial industry? Well, I think that that what we have seen over the last few few years will be accelerated by by, by this current uh, lockdown. Uh, we're talking about uh, agility, and and uh, this has been a, a, a huge topic within our organisations for for several years. But but it's not until now where it really ha has uh, where we really have taken a leap step in terms of of working in in a more agile way. 
Um, if you had asked me two and a half months uh, ago if it would be possible for us here in the UK to run an organization with two and a half thousand people and, and 200 branches across the country uh, using Skype, uh, mobile telephones and emails, I would definitely have said no. But surprisingly to myself, this is actually what we have been, been able to do uh, over the last uh, two months. And I think this is something that really is going to, to make huge changes in, in the way we we, uh, we manage our, uh, our businesses, how we communicate both internally uh, and externally, and also uh, in, in, in our focus and our capability of, of, uh, of making better prioritizations and, and uh, taking faster decisions. Uh, there's one particular question here from Victor Hedenberg. Do you believe government quantitative easing measures will end up <laughs> doing more harm than good? Uh, zero or negative interest rates and a non-stop printing press of money could do much more harm than good. What's your view on this? And I ought to ask Jerry Grimston on this as well as you've been in an investment bank for, until quite recently, Jerry. But Mikhail, yeah. first of all. Well, I would say, you know, I, I know it's, it's, it's probably an easy way around this, this question, you know, but in principle, I don't have any views on, on the, the initiatives and policies uh, uh, that are coming out of the Bank of England or, or the government. <laughs> and I, I think that, that I am probably also have some conflict of interest when we're talking about uh, uh, negative interest rates, because it will be a huge uh, issue for the financial industry to deal with the, with negative interest rates. We have seen that in, in other countries. And not only will it put a huge pressure on, on the top line, uh, which will then, of course, uh, at the end of the day, uh, be, be, be a problem with, with the profitability in the industry, but, but uh, uh, the systems in the industry, all these old legacy uh, systems that we have in, in the financial the service industry are not ready to deal with that, uh, I'm afraid. So uh, I don't have any views on, on, the, on the first part of the question. Negative interest, uh, I, I'm not in favor of, but as I said, uh, I'm probably uh, not the right one to, to, to answer that because there is a conflict of interest. Yeah. Jerry Grimston, of course, you serve the Queen now rather than your shareholders. Is it something you'd like to comment on or not? Uh, Mike, unmute yourself, can you, Jerry? Start again by the Bank of England but the point I would make is is that when you're faced with a health crisis of this magnitude people dying many many firms on the brink of collapse you have to take action and that action has to be resolute and determined now there will be a price to be paid for that action eventually but that price may not be for 10 15 20 years by which time let's all hope some normalcy has returned, economics have started expanding again. These are very, very difficult po policy judgments people are taking. But so my whole experience tells me you're better taking these judgments than letting matters drift. And in a sense, you have to deal with the situation that faces you because if you don't, boy, the problems would have been a lot, lot worse than they are. Thanks for the moment. Let me give you this comment uh, from Jan Olsen, who you all know from Deutsche Bank and obviously a senior figure in the chamber. And this is just a comment. I feel that a lot of the trends which we see right now, such as digitization and AI, started well ahead of the current mm -hmm. pandemic, picking up the principle I think all of you have uh, highlighted already. The current situation has simply accelerated already existing trends, not a question or an observation, as Jan says. But let me pick up uh, on one particular uh, question, which really is for all of you, from Sir Roger Gifford from SEB. Our societies rely on proximity, airlines, pubs, restaurants, theatres, concert halls and hotels. Huge volumes of service income effectively rely on closeness. How do we remove social distancing in the short and medium term? But I would like to add to, to Roger's question by saying, what about the fact that there is an assumption that somehow we will get back to where we were? And in Sweden, you've certainly proved that it can be done. Here in the UK, that's not happening. Is that an assumption that we can make, that there will be a degree of normality of social interaction, or that this is now going to be something which, when we emerge stronger on the other side, actually will be stronger with a different kind of way of running society? Helen. 
I'm just unmuting myself here. Yes, yeah, such an interesting topic, isn't it? So I do believe that we will, um, I get this question a lot, when will we go back to normal? I don't think we will go back. And hence, I think the topic of today is, is really good. I think there's something new emerging. I think uh, exactly as Jan is saying, this has been an incredible acceleration of digitalization. I believe we will take that and we will create that hybrid world with much more digitalization infused into how we make our lives and how we make our economies thrive together with an offline world. I think we all want interactions. We want to go to our local restaurant. We want to go to the concert. But I think it will not be as as um, discreet. It will not be as digital. If you take a, if you take a concert experience today, you have to be there in person. I think concert experiences in the future will include live streaming as well, which you will pay for because it's an experience. So I think you will not have everything so extremely either digital or extremely physical. I think we will create hybrid worlds. I think the workplace will look hugely different, like I think uh, Tom Johnston was speaking about. I don't think you will see cities where everybody goes to the office at 8 a.m. in the morning. It's an old, it's a very old fashioned thinking actually. And why would we do that? Now nobody goes to an office if you don't really need to go there. Uh, so why would we go in at the same time, for example? So I think we will see much more of a hybrid world. And I think that's the type of creation and getting out stronger that we have an opportunity to do. Tove, I saw you nodding agreement there. Yes, I agree. I mean, we had, it's true that the digitalization was going on, but we had a crash course now for, uh, especially in our educational system. And that must, we must bring all those benefits with us in the future. Uh, I also think, as, as Helen was pointing out, that, that the, work, the way we, we uh, you know, structure our work will change out of this experience we are gaining now. Uh, and I also think that, that we will have huge discussions over how we take care of the elder, the structure, the organization. And I think that people will know that now you are not going to an elderly care home if you are having some kind of, of, of infections in, in your body. So there are a lot of those knowledges which now seems to be silly that we didn't you know, do before. But sometimes the crisis will just bring out this and make it very clear for us. So there will obviously be a lot of good things that we uh, will bring. But I think that the social distancing, that is in general something that we are all suffering from because it's not natural. We want to be close and we want to be able to visit our older relatives. So this is unnatural. It's not being a human being that you're not close to each other and you would like to go out and dance, be ne near to people and... Uh, I, I had very early a suggestion. I, I guess there are lots of integral aspects on that, but everyone that had had been proven with uh, antibodies should have some kind of happy mark <laughs> to prove that one was safe. And of course, uh, I can see all all the discussions about that. But I think that I can now start to see people that actually are coming out on the other side of COVID nineteen. You know, being like when you let the cows out <laughs> after the long winter uh, winter uh, stay. So I think that we'll see that people will rejoice even more in being able to be close to each other uh, after this, but they will be so with a little bit more carefulness. Let me keep pressing that with, with Roger and Tom, if I may. I mean, spending money is about accelerating the economy, keeping the economy going. If like at the moment, people have money if they're lucky enough, but they're not spending it because they're saving it. This is a max, massive decelerator, quite apart from where the pubs and bars and restaurants and theatres open. And I come back what, to what Sir Roger says there, huge volumes of service income effectively rely on closeness. Are we going to have to accept that actually there'll be, if you like, less of a multiplication in the economic system? Tom. I, I think, so. I mean, first of all, the, the human being is very adaptable. I mean, look, look at how quickly we've adapted to this new way of working. So as we go forward, we will adapt to this new way. I don't think that, uh, I agree fully with Toby, uh, we miss the contact, the human contact with friends, with families, etc. Uh, uh, there. Uh, so I don't think we'll go back to where we were, but we'll find a new norm in how to operate in pubs, in restaurants, in, in, in theatre, as Helen 
was mentioning in but concerts, what about, people, well, what about if people don't but, have as much cash anymore? I mean, that will be an impact, without a shadow of a doubt, that will be an impact on people because it will take us time to recover. But remember as well, people have been saving the money just now that they have, just now. So there is a pent-up demand that can come at some point in time, but it'll be a different level. It won't be the same multiplier because we will have to live with a lower level of activity for some time. So it won't be the same multiplier by, as before, but there will be a multiplying effect in that there. And, and I also think uh, if, if you look through the, the comment that Jan made as well, go back to that, I agree fully. It was the trends he mentioned were coming. They will be accelerated now. They will be accelerated in business. They will be accelerated in how we operate. But to do that also, it's not only about the government investing as it's doing just now to put money in the economy. I go back to my little bugbear. We need to invest in technology. We need to invest in areas like 5G uh, there. Europe was ahead in 2G, 3G and 4G. We're behind significantly in 5G compared to other regions of the world. So I'd like to see more invested in that area, which will therefore make the experiences that Helene mentioned of concerts, the experiences of as being able to implement new technology will take uh, will be faster if we have the infrastructure to do that, and we don't have that in Europe just now, and we're and we're slowing down that investment at the moment. Roger, given the kind of portrait you gave of the dramatic cut you've had to make, just in and also the number of people, the number of your customers who've decided not to go ahead with their their orders at the moment, many of your trucks are used, of course, for shipping consumer goods. What is your expectation on this? That the way the, the economy is going to survive, literally you and us and all of us, how are we going to be convening and therefore what we're going to be needing and therefore this issue of the decelerator or the multiplier of the economy, the fear that the economy is going to go, as we know from all the figures from, from mm -hmm. the European Central Bank, from various national governors and so on, this is going to be dramatic, 8%, 10%, 15%, the figures are, are, are dreaming or nightmares at the moment, but they are significant. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, but what we have discovered many times before is economical downturns, but now it's another dimension with this pandemic situation as well, which is then creating then a fear in the society and people is not making them the investments and spendings as is normally happening. And of course, that will have an impact on our, on our volume, definitely. But as, as Tom said as well, people are adapting and people need to adapt and we need to learn to live with the new situation and we need to learn to live with social distance and whatever impact with that will have. But of course this will be resected once upon a time and then of course people will come back again and do the spending. But again then I agree with Tom, investments have to be done in certain areas. 5G is other infrastructure investments as well to get the economy coming back again and we need to then learn to work in a different way and, and I think that we as companies we can find a lot of efficiency gains what we are doing today and also then from a customer point of view that we can also then help our customers throughout the journey with digitalization as well so there is actually many things that we can do also then to protect the situation and improve the situation as well. Mikael, what's your view? Because you must have your chief economist and others who are looking at this, wondering uh, how money is going to flow in future, even if it's... Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I, I totally agree with, with what, what has been said. I think that, that uh, um, as I said earlier on, there will be new ways of working, new ways of communicating. And, and when, when, when the society has, has uh, figured out what's the, the best way forward, how are we going to, uh, to, to shop in the future? How are we going to go to the pub or, or to, to a rock concert in the future, then I, I think we will see a huge investments in these areas and, and uh, with developments which we cannot even think about uh, today, uh, what will be developed within these areas. The, the thing is that coming up, uh, back to what Helene said before, that, that uh, you know, hu human uh, uh, beings are a, a, a social animal and, uh, and we long for, 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 for making social contacts with other people. And, and I have, a lot of colleagues who really long uh, to to have the daily commute, uh, just the daily commute in the in the tube to and, and from work in London, and that just shows how important this for, for people. So I, I do th think that we would see a lot of investments in this area when 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 society uh, in general has decided what we want to get out of this. Jerry Grimston, you are from the Department for Business, 
energy and industrial strategy, even if it's evolving so quickly? What is your gut feeling about the level of economic activity and how much it'll be decelerated or whether it can be maintained even if in a different way? Well, look, let's, let's pose some stark questions and answer them. The key question, of course, is how quickly will medicine get on top of this pandemic and, and destroy it? Until that happens, and let's use sharper words than people sometimes use, until that happens, closeness greatly increases the chance of sickness and death. And that is a stark choice that will underlay economic activity and the extent to which it relies. Now, our parents in the past and generations in the past lived with death to a far greater extent than our generations have. You go back to generations, parts of the world, where TB was rife, where other dishes, where other diseases were rife. Absolutely rightly, properly, wonderfully, we have moved on from that. What this pandemic has done, it's brought back to people in all countries throughout the world, as I said earlier, the fact that we are now living with an illness where proximity to people can cause sickness and death. And one can debate the economic matters. One can think of ways of ameliorating that, as we surely should. But I don't sense that society is, wants to, or it is in a position to make that choice. Maybe if the disease isn't got on top of, and I sincerely hope it will, and I think there's some good signs it will, maybe people eventually will be prepared to make that choice. But at the moment, I think faced between the choice, as I say, of closeness and sickness and death, people will opt for life and for separation. And the, that will have profound economic consequences. Profound economic consequences. Absolutely. We're, we're talking about a very different way in which we conduct our lives. We can talk uh, absolutely so. And we're talking about, as far as for the foreseeable future, I'm afraid, potential of subdued economic activity, the possibility of continued government interventions. So the best efforts in the world have to be devoted towards producing the vaccine, which has to be a truly global enterprise, and using that vaccine, if it works, when it works, to eradicate this disease. There is no way of living with this disease globally which is compatible with our present economic models. Thank you. Um, does anyone want to pick that up? I've got plenty of other questions. We've got 20 minutes to run. Does anyone want to pick up that point from Lord Grimston for the moment? Okay, well, let me, uh, I, we can come back to it, of course. Um, there's a, a point here from Ragnar Agnell from Santigo. Reducing complexity in decision-making has been brought up as a key success factor by the panel to adapt quicker. How is this being done in practice? Who'd like to share their thoughts, Helen? Uh, now I'm unmuted. Um, so yeah, how? So I think there is one uh, one point which is um, uh, how do you do this when there is a crisis, uh, and then one how do we actually extend it into the new leadership? Indeed. And, uh, and I think if you start with the first one, we uh, once this hit and we understood the magnitude of this, we took uh, we took an, um, a corporate view or a group view of how to set the priorities and then move the decision making based upon those priorities. And I'll just, uh, without diving into details, but it comes back to one of the slides that Roger actually showed as well. We said, I mean, people in health go first and for our customers, it has to be having helping them with business continuity and first responders so anything that has to do with healthcare, that education our customers business continuity getting them up online and, and working quickly connecting their teams all over the world and, and and working in the way we are now working so all of those this, so we said this is the priority which meant we had put other things on the back burner that we thought we were going to do we couldn't do it all so we did that type of prioritization really clearly um, from a central place and then people could run with that. And I think that was one way of moving then the decision making out in the field, because if it was between different customers, et cetera, we had to do that close to the customers and not. So we set 
new emergency priorities if you want and then move the decision making out in the in the organization we made a lot of different decision making that we moved out because it the, the pressure on timing became so quickly so and i think that's that's a learning now some of them and now we are of course talking about that next phase as we are talking about here and some of them we we can roll some of them we don't need to be as uh we now we've increased capacity and all of it so now we don't need to stick to the first one for example but the second one we can then build, bring into our ongoing leadership how do we move more uh decision making into the uh to the people closest to the customers how do we reorganize so we are more organized by the customers so the customer experience leads and not for example the product so these are things that we are uh, able to adapt which i think will will then on a continuous basis speed up decision making which I think is of essence, actually. Tom? I, th I think there's two dimensions. I think the day-to-day -day operational issues have been, uh, I think already was underway, but have been much more pushed out to the operations to make the decisions in doing that. But when it comes to more strategic issues, uh, what should you invest in, where should you go, etc. I think what I've found with these virtual meetings is that we are much more, um, people, the, the message or the decision or the, the point that has to be made has been much clearer uh, presented. I think people come much better prepared to the meeting and I think the discussion is much more focused so you get to a conclusion. So I've actually found this way of working as a means to actually reduce complexity, i.e. there's less time for people to pontificate or to, to uh, go round about the, the houses. They're much more focused on what is the issue we're trying to solve? Let's get to a conclusion, let's make a decision, and let's move forward and then decentralize the, 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 the implementation of that out there. So I think that the reduced complexity has actually come from clarity of the problem and clarity of the decision making there. And I, I, you're seeing that. I, I think uh, the strategic issues are being addressed in a much better way. And these meetings are much more productive and efficient uh, and also much more timely. Uh, we heard from Jerry Grimston, 40%, he was quoting, I think, the chief executive, I think I know who it is, of a, of a major financial institution, a bank, talking about a 40% increase in productiveness, productivity of the call centre. Are you all seeing that kind of level of, um, the, that kind of, level of um, efficiency, of increased efficiency, even if people are more narrow-minded and maybe going a little stir-crazy? I, I see, you, see you smiling, Helen, or Mikhail or, or, or Roger. Are you, are you seeing that level of efficiency? that kind of 40% increase in efficiency. Roger? I, I cannot cannot mention any any number, but, but I, I see that the dedication in the people is of a lot more on a different level. And of course, in a crisis situation, people come together in a different way, solving the problems in a more simple, simple way and in a more easiest way. And, and we, we are working heavily now to move out more decisions to the front line closer to the customer. So of course we, we have a productivity in our organization as we have a lot less more people that is working with us for the moment. And uh, Michael? Yeah, well, 40% uh, that sounds quite hard, but, but uh, in, in the beginning of the lockdown we, we, had to, we worked with different scenarios uh, where we actually uh, uh, estimated a loss of productivity of, uh, in worst case scenario, uh, 20 to 30 percent. And, and initially, it, it, uh, we did lose a lot of productivity uh, and efficiency, uh, but, but it has uh, since, that, since then improved. And, and in certain areas, uh, we are definitely more productive today than we, than we used to be. I don't know if, if it's 40 percent, but definitely more. But coming back to also to the question, you know, with, with the daily management and the, the, the productivity there, um, it is, uh, it is really a, a matter of, of prioritizing really, really hard and prioritizing, uh, up prioritizing uh, things that are vital for, for the customers and, and, uh, and for the organization. Uh, and and uh, what we have been doing in our organization is that instead of having uh, uh, monthly very long meetings with a very uh, uh, fixed uh, agenda that we had to go through, then we have introduced a much more frequent meeting, uh, but much shorter meetings uh, without any agenda or at least a very short agenda. And, and there we are able to, to take uh, decisions on the spot and also uh, are able to change those decisions if it turns out uh, that they are, they are not uh, correct. And that's really something that, that has speeded up uh, our uh, decision making in the organization. All right, because um, Henrik uh, Lofgren has just uh, posted this, how do your organizations work now with shaping your future setup? 
bringing the best from working from home, commuting and the office into your future ways of working, organizing yourself and collaborating, which raises an extra question is, what value is real estate going to have in the office world in the future? Helen. Yeah, you want me to start? Yes, yeah, so I think the, and it connects to the other one. I think we see uh, absolutely an increased efficiency on, uh, on anything transactional. I think this is much more efficient. I think the, the other part and where we are, I think, um, working in our own leadership every single day is how do we solve for the engagement, the co-creation, the innovation, uh, the brainstorming sessions, uh, which doesn't come as natural when you're on video all day, et cetera. So, uh, and, and as you learn to use more of the, as I think as you learn, learn to use more of the tools, it's not just a video, there is the chat, there is the whiteboard, uh, there are other apps to move in there, et cetera, et cetera. So you, there's much more to use, but still I think the, that side of it uh, is where we as people, uh, I think have a, a little bit of a longing to be in the same room when we do this uh, and these types of co-creation and innovation. Uh, and that's where we are practicing and we try new things all the time. And, you and have data from Microsoft uh, showing the level Sorry? of usage. You have data from Microsoft on the level of usage and the, the, the way that is being changed. Yeah, well, we, so the thing is, so at Microsoft, it's a little bit particular. So Microsoft's strategy is that work is something you do, not a place you go to. So all basically all my meetings on a normal day, there's somebody who is on the video. There's somebody who is someplace else. So we never have everybody in the office. So we were quite trained in this and, and I think our data shows that we're all somehow online in, in, in the meetings. So it's a little bit particular. I think the this part about doing breakout sessions and co-creations and all of that, that we were not, I think we've become so much better at that because we're training all the time. And, right. part, and parts of those tricks are really doing that, doing a meeting like this, doing the breakout sessions, doing, you know, walk and talks in the middle of it. So you actually go and refresh your brain, you come back, you present it on the whiteboard. So I think those are those are the ones to, to train ourselves on, um, I believe. And I think when it comes to the office of the, office of the future, I think very few of the transactional meetings will be done there. I think- Sorry, I'll come to you in a moment, but Roger, I know you've got to leave in a moment, and obviously you're dealing with a manufacturing. You can't work from home and produce a truck. What, what are you seeing? Maybe you can with 3D printing. Uh, and same with- yeah, may, 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 Maybe the future oh. will tell, tell us if that is possible or not. But, <laughs> but today you, we don't, today we don't to moment, So just make your point, can you? Yeah, today we don't we don't have that uh, possibility to do that. But maybe in the future it will be. But of course, of course, it, it will drive changes. Uh, and we we don't only have factories. We have also a corporate office. We have market company office. We have dealerships and so forth as well. And and do we need to have all these kind of offices into the future? I don't believe so. I think that we can work in a completely different simplicity in a different way of working. And then it's also then being closer to our customers. And, and, but all over, we, we, we have a 10, we in our business, we need to meet people. And how do you build these relations with the customers? And how do you build them the team? And that is something that we need to learn to work with into the new normal as well. Uh, Tove, what's your view about working from home and, and the way that is developing? Is it in danger of being a distraction from the enormous earthquake that we're all experiencing, the seismic change to the way we think, work, exchange views with people, just uh, commune with people as well? What are you seeing? I think there is a risk that uh, that you narrow your your <laughs> the viewing the, your view because you are being in a small part of the world having uh, discussions with a selection of people and you won't just bounce into people you don't know that will you know spark off new thoughts and ideas so i think the i mean i can of course uh, appreciate losing two hours a day every day two hours time every day not commuting so i can do a lot of other things with those two hours but there is also an alternative cost what i didn't experience on on commuting uh, and I think I just want to remind that there are so many different experiences now. Some are really thriving, finding and developing new uh, sides of their lives and, um, and businesses as well. 
but some are now also experiencing the worst time and the most horrific and devastating time of their life, uh, professionally and socially, and the sense of being stuck in time. And I think that these different experiences will create a kind of currency to use politically, and we don't know what it is yet. And I just also want to, to, to feed in that when we talk about increased efficiency and reducing complexity to speed up decision process, this is true for business sector and civic society. It's not true for others. It's not true for science. It's not true for politics, uh, neither the national level nor the EU level because it's based on democracy and that uh, process is slow. It needs to be slow. So I think we'll also find that the cultural indifferences between the different spheres in society will be even more clearer uh, during and after these crises, because uh, the way of handling the crisis will be very diff different. Right. Now, we're about eight minutes from the end. I've still got some more questions. What I'd like to give you notice of is, can you in one minute at the end, each of you, uh, give me a view of where you think your st how you define your stability and frame your stability, say, two or three years from now, what the shape will be of your business. Uh, and Jerry Grimston, um, this is the question which I've held back right from the beginning, and you're probably expecting it, um, which came from Nicholas Nordstrom, AIM Public Affairs. Can this situation speed up the after Brexit plan from the UK side? What steps should be taken in the relationship between UK and Sweden to promote trade, investments and growth? Your area precisely, and there are two or three other questions as well, but you can see where this is coming from. Um, is the 31st of December going to be extended? And will there be a stable United Kingdom to invest in and do business with? I, I think the 31st of December will not be extended. Um, we have already left the European Union. Um, I think there are very intense negotiations going on, as always with negotiations of that sort. Um, a certain amount can be done by officials. You always end up with some items which have to be settled at a political level. And I think the next leap forward on that will be when our Prime Minister meets political leaders from Europe. They will look at these half a dozen decisions. They will come to a view about it. What I will say is that I think the imperative for nations to form strong free trading agreements has been massively increased by this pandemic. The, as I said earlier, the way to create economic recovery going forward is through global trade and investment. So I think there will be a pressure on all leaders to want to push forward with agreements that facilitate global trade and investment. Um, on the specific case between Sweden and UK, and as I said earlier, we have very strong relationships. Um, if there is anybody who has any particular questions they would like to ask, um, we have a team of experts working in this area, and I'm sure people can find out my email. Very happy that the Chamber of Commerce supply my email, and of course our experts will do all we can as ever to help UK Sweden, UK Swedish trade and investment continue and flourish. And it may, it may be inappropriate, and I may be ahead of the curve, but obviously there's reporting in the United Kingdom in the last few days, including this morning, that Nissan may be about to develop significantly its plant up in the northeast of England in Sunderland, the biggest car um, manufacturing uh, facility in the United Kingdom, what is still a United Kingdom. Uh, is there anything you can say about that, if it's coming, and also um, what that might say about confidence for investing in the UK? Well, um, I speak to chairman and chief executives of companies around the world because I feel I'm the concierge service <laughs> for these people, though I don't book their restaurants um, <laughs> around the world. And I would say, and I won't obviously refer to individual companies' circumstances, but I, I have detected a real feeling of wanting to move forward. They do see that the UK has certain skills, advanced manufacturing, the links between our great universities and our industry, um, some sectors where we have very strong things. And I think people will take advantage of that. And I don't think I'm just being starry eyed. All countries have competitive advantage. Sweden has competitive advantage in many areas. What people will be looking at going forward will be investing where they can take advantage of competitive advantage. 
And I think the governments are going to be greatly incentivized to help that competitive advantage. And where you have sectors which at the moment are good to invest in, our policy will be to make them excellent to invest in going forward. So I, have, I really feel when I talk to people about this, I get back a spirit of optimism. All right, Jerry, thanks for the moment. And we're just coming to the end, but can I just ask you that one minute question? First to Tom Johnson. Um, where, how are you going to find the stability in Hathrada in a year or two? What, where do you think, what kind of framing and shape do you think your company will have? I think I'll take it two dimensions. One, the company. I think uh, there'll be a different way of working. Exactly how it will be, I've got to say, I'm not sure. But it will result in fewer offices in more remote working. I think there'll be an increased use of technology in our business, uh, as in e-learning, uh, in how we are, operate with our customers, in our manufacturing with AI, etc. I think there'll be a much more regional uh, manufacturing uh, footprint for us than we had before. So I think these are things that if I switch to a board dimension, I think in the, the, the way we operate in the board will change as well. I think this has shown that the business model resilience uh, and change has to be much more uh, in focus. The balance sheet strength has to be much more in focus as well. Uh, they're much higher up on the agenda. I think there has to be more expertise in the board with the different skill sets. So I actually see, and, and, and then risk and how we, how we evaluate risk will be higher on the agenda. So I think for the company, there's certain things. I think for boards, how we operate in boards will change as, as well uh, as we go forward. That's going to take a lot of heavy lifting, I would suggest, particularly on risk, because Absolutely. risk officers tend to be quite narrow-minded in this kind of thing, and boards as well. Uh, Mikhail, your, your view of where uh, you and your bank, will, where, mm -hmm. where the financial sector will be? In a year well, that, that's two questions. Uh, we will not necessarily follow the, the, the path of, of, the, of the rest of the, of the sector. As for, for, for us as concerned, I think that we will have the same business model as we do today, but we will be a much more focused uh, and, and flexible organization. We will probably have smaller branches, not necessarily uh, fewer uh, branches, but, but uh, probably uh, smaller branches with more hot disks and, and, uh, and, and new technology, which was already you know, coming be before the lockdown. Um, and, and then I think there will be a, a hybrid way of working, you know, partly for, from, from those hot desks in the office and partly uh, from the road or from, from home. Thank you, Miguel. Um, but people will still want to use money in cash, will they? Because one of the extraordinary things, certainly in the United Kingdom, is that you can go to a shop, the shops that are open or the supply stores, and the only thing they'll take now is um, the, 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 the card. Yeah, I think that that will probably uh, um, uh, accelerate uh, um, the, the development that we have already seen. Thank you. Uh, Tove, the societal framing that you'll see in a year or two, the, the, the scars, but also the way people can reevaluate themselves and reevaluate the way they want to actually live. Yeah, I think we are actually we are doing that now, and it's difficult to see what it will lead to because I think that in the end we are individuals, so we will make a lot of different some terms from what we are experiencing now. Can I just just say two words about mass media since I'm also working on 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 a on a paper, and we were already uh, before this in a structural change and undergoing a, a large transform, and some of the the processes have been fast forwarded by the pandemic now added some extra burdens like the market for ads are plummeting at the same time at, at the paradox is that there's a huge demand for, for news for the moment and journalism so I think that uh, the media houses will be uh, learning a lot from this some will go down but some will will flourish from the experience now and when it comes to politics it can go either way because the societal fear that of other people that we know now and from you know good reasons that can come in many nasty shapes and i think that we'll need long-sighted responsible politicians good leaders who can speak and act for open societies after this not closed narrow and fearful ones and i think that it all now depends on what kind of personal experience you have what kind of politicians you also are seeking for after the crisis Thank you, Toby. Finally, uh, Helen, your, your view. Um, we're, we're, we're talking on Zoom. Will everyone be using Teams next time? I hope so. Um, I, well, I, 
<laughs> we are, I mean, we are obviously a tech company. So uh, I think from our, from my perspective, I think what we do, what we provide are really the platforms that are enabling many of the things we talked about here today. So that's, of course, the stability of the backbone is to keep investing in platforms that enables that world we're talking about. But I think if you take that a step further for Microsoft, I think it is about being part of creating that hybrid world. We don't want either or. I think we all need that. We need to create that. And that comes with what, what values are we adding to that? How do we want society to look like? What's the sustainability aspect in all of this, which we haven't really talked about today. So I think if you add that to the technical platforms that are enablers, I think you can create that hybrid world. And I think my last point is that I think what it means to a company like Microsoft is, is that we need to get even closer to our customers and closer to society, closer to the countries to really partner up. And, and one part of that partnering, I believe, needs to be around skilling up. And how do we skill up actually our whole countries? Because everybody needs to be able to take part of that. Only then can you make that inclusive society where technology becomes an enabler and not actually dividing, dividing the countries. So I think that last part is extremely important for all of us. Thank you, Helen. Um, uh, Peter, would you like a final word? And as you just prepare a thought or two, um, can I just offer you my thanks enormously? J Jerry Grimston, uh, the Minister uh, for Investment, um, thank you very much indeed for joining us and staying with us, if I may, because obviously uh, you have a, a busy schedule in, in government. And also to Roger, who had to nip away for another meeting. But all, all, to all four of you as well, thank you very much indeed. I think it's been a very rich 90 minutes with some uh, excellent questions. And I hope we've driven the, the agenda forward in a way which makes you think, even if you're intimidated and worried about what's coming, that there is actually a positive way forward. And this is what leadership is about. It's about being realistic and learning how to deal with these uh, uncertainties, what we call unthinkables, thinking about them. They may be unpalatable, but they are actually uh, able to be embraced. So, uh, Lord Grimston, thank you very much indeed. And thank you all very much indeed. And Peter, would you like a final word? Just a, a few words, my end. That I'm obviously on, sort of on the, on the same thought as you. And let's not stop the positive development uh, accelerated through the crisis. Uh, we talked about efficiencies uh, being made and digitization taking place. But as Tuva said as well, social distancing is not a natural to human beings. So that's something I personally will gladly leave behind uh, at some point. I also want to thank Lord Grimstone and as a, a recent UK citizen as well. Uh, I love the promise of making the UK the most investable country in the world, or one of, the, one of them. Um, and uh, from that point as well, I mean, the Swedish-British relationship to us, it's our daily bread. Uh, and it's so, so important, um, not the least of the businesses that have joined in on this um, webinar, but also some of them on, uh, on the panel. Um, we're hosting a, a webinar on that topic on the 9th of June. I'm expanding to the UK with lots of people joining. Um, so it's something that we fly the flag for all the time. Thanks to Nick um, um, for moderating this today. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks to our sponsors, Handelsbanken and Volvo Trucks. Thanks to our partners. And I hope to see you all soon. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.